Okay, so today we are starting chapter four, which is all going to be over graphing polynomial functions and um, finding the various parts of polynomial functions and the different types of polynomial functions. So 4.1 is specifically titled polynomial functions. So what in the world is a polynomial function? Well, it has a positive whole number exponents. That's key. So if you, quadratics, those are x squared, those are polynomial functions. Polynomial functions, though, can have, obviously, upper, like, it's not just x squared. You can have x to the third, x to the twelfth, x to the whatever. Um, usually, we see these written in descending order based on their exponential power. So that is a really good habit to get into. Some of your problems might not present themselves that way at, to start with, and so you're going to want to reorder your polynomial function so that it is descending. Meaning, if it's an x squared, you're going to have x squared first, then you have your x term, then you have your constant term, and so on and so forth. That's going to help you here in a little bit when we talk about our leading term test and all this other stuff that we're going to do in order to graph these polynomial functions. Um, the leading term, that's another term you should know, is the term with the highest exponential power. If you have your polynomial written in descending order, then your leading term is literally the first term. And so that's one of the other reasons why it's nice to go ahead and write them that way, so that your leading term is the one that's leading. Um, and then your leading coefficient is the coefficient on that leading term. And the degree of the polynomial is your highest exponential power. Again, if you have it written in descending order, it's going to be the degree of the very first term. So those are all different things that we were going to talk about. And this table that's kind of here in the middle of the page um, came straight out of your book, but I liked it because it gives you some examples of various functions and what those, or various polynomial functions, and what they look like in general terms, but then also what the degree of that polynomial function is, the leading term of that polynomial function, and the leading coefficient. Because I know for a fact some of your homework assignments are just going to be asking, what is the degree? What is the leading term? What is the leading coefficient? Um, so this first one, we just have a constant polynomial function. Notice there is no x in there. It's just f of x equals 3. So they do expand that for you a little bit so that you can see that that's the same thing as writing 3 to the x to the 0th power, because anything to the 0th power is what? 1. And so the only reason why they expanded it for you is so that when you go to the degree, you recognize this is a zero degree polynomial function because there is no x's at all. The leading term would be 3. The leading coefficient would be 3. Nothing special there. We go to our linear. This is y equals mx plus b form. The degree would be 1 because there's only one x. The leading term includes the x. The leading coefficient does not. That's kind of how you differentiate between the leading term and the leading coefficient. They do the same thing for quadratic, cubic, and quartic. I don't think we, we probably have special names for everything after that, but we don't really say that. Are there questions on how we find the degree, the leading term, or the leading coefficient on any of this stuff? That leading term and the degree is going to come in very, very important when it comes to graphing these polynomial functions. Okay. So let's look at some graphs of polynomial functions. Polynomial functions have two requirements. They have to be smooth. They have to be continuous. What that means is a smooth means that there are no sharp angles. There's no corners. There's no points. And continuous means that if I can put my pin on it, I should be able to trace that graph the entire way without having to pick it up and move it. If you are not both of those things, you're not a polynomial function. So polynomial functions, we have our quadratic, we have our linear, we have our cubic, this is our quartic. But then down here, this is an absolute value. Again, that's a function, but it's not a polynomial function. It's got a corner. Not a function because it stops. Here we do a dip again. In this one, we jump. 
So polynomial functions have to be smooth. They have to be continuous. Let's flip over so that we can talk about our leading coefficient test or our leading term test. Your book calls it the leading term test. Um, the way I always learned it was the leading coefficient test. It's really the exact same thing. So if you hear me say leading coefficient test on accident, just know that it means leading term test. Um, while I like this diagram, this box area, I also think it can be a bit confusing. So here's what I want you to see. The leading coefficient test or the leading term test, what it's going to tell us is the end behavior of our graphs. So it's going to tell us what happens at the extreme left and the extreme right of our graphs. It's not going to tell us anything about the middle, just the end points. And there's really different options based on if our function is an even function or an odd function. And that comes not from whether the whole function is even or odd, but whether the leading coefficient, the leading, uh, the degree of our polynomial, whether that is even or odd, okay? So if the degree of our polynomial is even, then our end behaviors are going to go the same direction. They're going to go both up or they're both going to go down. That's what's represented over here. So if our leading coefficient is positive, then they're both going to go up. If our leading coefficient is negative, they're both going to go down. Again, notice that there's dotted lines in between those, and that's because we don't know what's going on in between. We're, we have other things to help with that. But just for our leading coefficient or leading term test, we're only going to discover what happens at the ends. So if the degree of our polynomial is an even degree, they're both going to go up if our leading coefficient is positive, or they both go down if our leading coefficient is negative. Now, if our degree of our polynomial is odd, then we have the other situation on the other side. If our leading coefficient is positive, then we fall on the left and rise on the right. The way that I think about this one is that overall we're moving upward, we're moving positive in our graph. If you follow your graph all the way. Whereas over here, if our coefficient is negative, then we are having a negative slope, quote unquote, like if this was a linear equation where it rises to the left and it falls to the right. These ones will take a little bit for you to memorize just simply because they go in the opposite direction. Um, they don't go together like our evens do. So when we do the leading coefficient test or leading term test, there's two things we're going to have to do. The first thing we have to do is we have to identify our leading coefficient and whether it is positive or negative. The other thing we have to do is we have to identify the degree of our polynomial because that's going to tell us whether we have an even degree or an odd degree. Okay, so those are the two things you have to look for. And we're going to do four or five of them where we just are determining the end behavior. So if you see something that says determine the end behavior, you see something that says use the leading term test to determine end behavior, it's the same thing. What we're going to do is we're going to note on these. If it's not written in descending order, I would recommend writing them in descending order just to make it clearer. Um, we have x to the fourth, x to the third, and then a constant, so this is in descending order. We have our biggest power on the left all the way down to our smallest power on the right. So if I'm looking at this, what is my leading coefficient? Three. Three. And is that positive or negative? Okay, so we have a positive leading coefficient. And what is the degree of this polynomial? Four. Four, yeah. Which is even. So we have even and we have positive. Positive even means we're going to go up, up. So up, up. When it comes to a test, that's the kind of stuff I would expect to see. Arrows going up, up. Okay, what about for number two? What is our leading coefficient? 
negative 5. You just said it's negative. And then what is our uh, degree of our polynomial? 3. So that's odd. We have a negative odd situation going on. So negative odd is where it rises on the left and it falls on the right. Okay. What about number three? What is our leading coefficient? Four. How do you know that? Five That's right. This one isn't written in descending order. So if you wanted to, you could write it in descending order where you'd have x to the fifth plus one fourth x plus one, and then you could go from there to identify your leading coefficient. Don't just assume it's the very first term because they may not have it written in the descending order. So yes, you are correct. One is right there in front of our x to the fifth because it's not written there. So that would be a positive. And then you said fifth was the highest. That's the degree and that's odd. So we have positive odd, which means we go down on the left and up on the right. What's the end behavior for four? Down, down. down. Yep, yeah. we have a negative out front, and it's even. So we're going to go down, down. What do you think about the last one? Like, what's the leading coefficient? Okay, negative 4. So it's negative. But then what's the degree of this polynomial? Three. Okay. X to the 6th, I think. X to the 6th, yes. This one is slightly different because if you look at it, you have your term times a term times a term. When you multiply all those out, which I'm not going to make you do. Don't, don't look at that and be like, oh my gosh, i got to do all this foiling. No. But if you did, notice you have an x to the third. Here you would have an x squared, and here you would have an x. So if all your terms are being multiplied together, then we have to add those different exponents. So we have an x to the third, we have an x squared, and we would have an x to the first. So 3 plus 2 plus 1 does equal 6, which is the degree. Degree, if I can write degree. So this is a sixth degree, which is an even. So we have a negative even, meaning we're going down, down. None of the rest of those we had to worry about that because they were already like in their expanded form. But if they give it to you where it's already factored, then you have to think about what happens if you were to unfactor it as it would be. And that's where you have to add in those different um, exponents. Are there questions? Because that one's a little weird. I get it. So add the degrees. OK. So another term you're going to hear are the zeros of the polynomials. Zeros are the same thing as roots. Sometimes you'll hear it say, find the roots or they'll ask you for the solutions, or they're going to ask you for the x-intercepts. All three, four of those things mean the exact same thing. Zeros, roots, solutions, and x-intercepts are all asking for the exact same thing. They want to find out where your polynomial function equals zero. And so that's when we set it equal to zero and we solve it. Because we need to have these zeros to figure out what's going on in our graph in between our endpoints, between our end behavior. So we're getting pieces and pieces and pieces of things so that we can figure out how to graph this. So this first example at the top says determine if 2 and negative 5 are zeros of p of x equals x to the third plus x squared minus 17x plus 15. How do we determine if they're zeros? Yeah, we plug them in. 
we're going to plug them in and see if we get zero. If we get zero, then they're zeros. If we plug them in and we don't get zero, they're not zeros. This is a plug and chug problem. So we're going to find P of 2. That'll be 2 to the third plus 2 squared minus 17 times 2 plus 15. We get negative seven. So P of two does not equal zero, so it's not a zero. And then you would do the exact same thing for P of five, negative five, excuse me. So if you're asked to verify if anything's a zero or not, We've done this before in the past where, we're, where we were asked to verify if something was a solution to an equation. That's what we're doing. Because solution is the same thing as zero. So plug it in, see if we get zero. If we get zero, it's a zero. If we don't get zero, it's not a zero. Questions on that? Okay. So what if we have to actually do the finding of the zeros? That's what we're gonna do in the next couple examples. And luckily, the first one was really nice because they already factored it all for us. And if we're trying to find out the zeros, what we're going to do is we set our function equal to zero. Now, notice on this first one, we have x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x minus 2 times x plus 1. Is there a way that we can shorten that x minus 2, x minus 2, x minus 2? x minus 2 to the third. I don't want to write that three times. Now think back to our quadratics. When we factored them and we got them into factors like this, how did we figure out where our zeros were, where our solutions were? What did we do? Come on, what do we do? If I had 0 equals x plus 1 times x minus 2 and I wanted to know where x was 0, what would I do? I set them equal to 0, right? I'd set x plus 1 equals to 0 and x minus 2 equal to 0 and I figure out where my x's are. That's exactly what we do here. Because, I mean, this 5 out here, is it going to matter? Because we can get rid of it by dividing both sides by 5. 0 divided by 5 is what? Zero. x minus 2 to the third times x plus 1. So now I'm just going to set each of my factors equal to 0 and solve. Set x minus 2 quantity to the third equals 0. To get rid of that third, I would cube root both sides. You cube root 0, nothing changes, so you don't have to worry about it. Add the 2 over and you find x equals 2 x plus 1 equals 0, subtract that 1 over and you get x equals negative 1. So the zeros for this are x equals 2 and x equals negative 1. You could also see them written as a set like this where they put it in curly brackets because then it means a set and you just put your values 
One other thing I want you to notice is what was the degree of this polynomial? Yeah, it's a fourth degree polynomial because we have three here and then we'd have a one here. If we multiplied all that together, we'd get x to the fourth. This is a fourth degree polynomial. The way polynomial functions work is that tells you at most how many zeros you're going to get. So if you have a fourth degree polynomial, the maximum number of zeros you can get is four. You can get less than that. This is one where we get less than it. We only get two zeros. That's totally okay. It's a fourth root. You can get four, three, two, one, or zero zeros. Okay? But that's kind of nice to know going into it where you're like, like on the next problem, I could have three zeros, I could have two zeros, I could have one zero, or I could have no zeros. But if I'm doing some weird math and somehow I get four zeros and it's a third root, then I know I did something wrong. Okay? So that's kind of a neat little helpful thing. That's called multiplicity, and we will actually talk about that in 4.2. So yes, it does play a part when it comes to graphing. Um, that is the multiplicity, and that is talked about in the very next section. So it's definitely not something you want to just ignore. What the multiplicity does, like you said, is it tells us that we got that answer, we got it three times, and so when you have an odd multiplicity, that's where you go through on your graph, and when you have an even multiplicity, your graph bounces at that point. And so you'll see that in the very next section, so that's a great question. But when it comes to just finding the zeros, it doesn't matter what that is. It doesn't matter what our multiplicity is. Okay. We've got to find the zeros for this polynomial function, so we're going to set it equal to zero. And then we need to figure out what to do with it. When there's four terms, the best, safest route to go is to factor by grouping. Okay? Factor by grouping is where you look at two terms, usually the first two if it's written in descending order. And you say, okay, what does x to the third minus 2x squared, what do those two terms have in common? x squared. Yeah. So I'm going to pull that out. And that will leave me with an x minus 2. Now, once I've done that, I'm going to have to look at the next set of terms. And the goal here, when you factor by grouping, is to get the exact same thing inside your parentheses. So what does negative 9x and a positive 18 have in common? 9. Okay, if I pull out a 9, that's going to leave me with a negative x plus 2. I've got to pull out a negative. That way, when I distribute that negative 9 in, I'm going to have a positive x and a negative 2. Because I want the same thing inside those parentheses. And here's why. Once you've factored by grouping and you get the same thing inside the parentheses, even though this looks long and convoluted, what we really have is we have one term here and we have one term here. We only have two terms. We have a binomial. So if I'm looking at this term versus this term, what do they have in common? Yeah, they got the x minus 2, so I can pull that out front. And if I pull that x minus 2 out, what am I left with? I'm left with the x squared minus 9. That's why when we factor by grouping, we want the same thing. So we can pull it out front. And then do we know anything special about this? It's a difference of squares. That's right. Difference of squares, that means we can factor it into x minus 3 and x plus 3. Now, let's say you didn't recognize that. If you didn't recognize that that was a difference of squares, it's not the end of the world, what you would do is you would still just set both of your terms equal to zero, and when you solve it, <coughs> excuse me, you'd do the square root principle where you'd add the nine over to the other side, and then when you square root, the one thing you'd have to be careful about is you have the plus minus. So you definitely have to be careful about that. Because now that we have it all factored, we can set each of these equal to zero so that we have x equals 2, x equals 3, and x equals negative 3. Would you, because I did the square root principle, and I left this plus or minus 3 and 2. Would that still work, or would you prefer to write 
On a test, I don't care. Okay. Um, what your homework <laughs> prefers, I don't know. So I recommend trying it. If they neglect your plus or minus, then don't use it, obviously. Um, when it comes to a test, I have no problem if you say plus or minus. And notice this was a third degree polynomial. We did find three degrees this time, or three zeros. Questions on that one? Oh, actually, we talk about multiplicity today. Sorry, it's down on the page. All right, the next one. We have f of x equals x to the fourth plus 4x four squared minus 45. So I'm going to set that equal to 0. And then I don't really want to think about factoring by grouping because I only have three terms. But what does this look a lot like? It looks a whole lot like a quadratic, doesn't it? Because a quadratic would look like x squared plus 4x minus 45. It would look like that. But what we have is we have x to the fourth and x squared and then a constant. Here's the nice thing, though, is that our even powers work the same way as a quadratic. So we can factor this the same way we would factor this. So when we would factor this, what we would do is we'd say, okay, we have an x and an x because that's how we get our x squared. And then we'd look over here and say, okay, we have a negative, so that means we're going to have a negative and a positive, and we need uh, factors of 45. So there's 1 and 45, and there's 5 and 9. If I subtract these, I need to get to a positive 4. Well, it's not happening there, but it would happen here. Yeah, negative 5 and a positive 9. So that's how we would factor it if it was just a standard quadratic. The way that we factor it with it being a quartic, I guess is how they say it, is the exact same way. The only difference is, is I have to get x to the fourth, so what are my first terms going to be? x squared. Because x, x squared times x squared is definitely going to get me to x to the fourth. And then I have the exact same thing inside. I'll have a minus 5 and a plus 5, or a plus 9, excuse me. Now be careful here. We don't have a difference of squares. That's a plus. And five is not a perfect square. So you're definitely going to want to set these both equal to zero and do your square root method. Where x squared minus five equals zero, x squared equals five, square root both sides, and you get x equals plus or minus the square root of five. Don't give a decimal. That will be wrong. For the other one, we would have x squared plus 9 equals 0. x squared equals negative 9. Square root, square root. So x equals what? Plus or minus 3i. Plus or minus 3i. That's right. Don't just assume that you can't play with it anymore because it's got a square root of a negative. We've overcome that barrier. We've played with imaginary numbers now, so we can get those as actual solutions. We'd have plus or minus 3i. So don't just stop there and say there's no solution because we would have an imaginary number. No, that's okay. Unless it specifies that you can't have an imaginary number. If you get an imaginary number, there's nothing wrong with it. Are there questions, comments, concerns? Okay, we kind of already had a preview for the next bit. I forgot that it showed up in 4.1. I thought it only showed up in 4.2. But multiplicity is what we were talking about earlier for how many times we get a certain answer. So it says if r is a zero of even multiplicity, then the graph touches the x-axis and turns around, a.k.a. it bounces back. So you don't actually go through at that zero. You touch it and come back. If r is a zero of odd multiplicity, then the graph crosses the x-axis at r. So up here... In this example that we had earlier, notice if I hadn't combined that all together, I would have gotten two, two, two. So I would have gotten two three times. 
which is the power here. That power tells me my multiplicity. So that means I have an odd multiplicity, so I would cross at that point. And then the x plus 1, I only had that one time, so it also has an odd multiplicity, meaning I would cross at that point. Okay? What is r? It's just the letter they're using. Okay. If r is a 0, so one of your zeros that you found. Okay. So any of these zeros that we found up here, however many times we find that specific 0, is its multiple. You'll see it on the next one. We're going to graph something. We're going to do all of the things on the next one. All of the things. Find the zeros, find the multiplicity, and then do a sketch of the basic graph for negative x to the fourth plus 4x to the third minus 4x squared. Now, before we get started, let's figure out what's going on at the ends. Okay? Let's do our leading term test. So what is my leading coefficient? Negative one. Negative one. And what is the degree of this polynomial? Four. Four. So that is even. So negative even, what's going on at the ends? Down, down. down and down. So I like to note that straight out of the gate so I know what's going on. Okay, now we got to figure out what our zeros are. So I'm going to say 0 equals negative x to the fourth plus 4x to the third minus 4x squared. Now, don't be tempted to just immediately treat this one exactly like the last one because this one isn't set up like the last one. This has an x to the fourth, an x to the third, and an x to the squared. So what do they all have in common? Yeah, an x squared. Let's, let's factor that out. And actually, look at this. There's a negative here on this first term. Let's factor out a negative x squared just so that the first term inside of our parentheses is positive. So if I factor out a negative x squared, that's going to leave me with an x squared minus 4x plus 4. Notice what's left inside of our parentheses. It's a nice little quadratic. We know how to play around with those. We've been doing that for a while now. So 0 equals negative x squared. And if I need to factor this on the inside, I would have x squared. So I have an x and an x. If the sign in front of your c is positive, that tells you the signs in here are the same. The sign in front of your b tells you what those signs are. So they're both negative. So I need factors of 4 that add up to 4. 2 and 2. Okay, well notice I have the exact same thing twice. So I'm going to go ahead and just rewrite it. Where I have x minus 2 quantity squared. Now I have my two terms that I set equal to 0 to figure out what my zeros are. Negative x squared equals 0. So x equals 0 x minus 2 squared equals 0, so x equals 2. So I found my zeros at 0 and 2, but what are my multiplicities at these zeros? Huh? Two. Mm -hmm. We got two twos, so this has a multiplicity of 2. And how many times do we get 0? Yeah, because it has a power as well, power of 2. I could split that, and I would have x times x, and if I said each of my x is equal to 0, I'd get 0 twice. So x equals 0 also has a multiplicity of 2. So that means at both of my zeros, I'm going to bounce. Now, this one says just sketch a basic graph, and it, it says basic graph because we don't have a lot of other information still to go on. In 4.2, we're going to use a couple more different things to make our graphs even more um, accurate, but right now this is more than enough. So what I'm going to do is on this left graph, I'm going to go ahead and graph what I have. I know I have a 0 at 0, and I know I have a 0 at 2. So at 0, I'm going to put a, z a dot. And at 2, I'm going to put a dot. Okay. 
Now that's all I have right now. Those are the zeros. But I know from my leading term test, I know what happens at the outer limits, right? And we decided that it was a negative even, and so it's going to go down, down. So if I go to my outer limits, I know I'm going to go down, and I know I'm going to go down. And then we found our multiplicity, which said at each of my zeros, I bounce. So I'm not going through my axis, I'm bouncing. So I need to come back down here, and I need to come back down here. I bounced, I bounced, I didn't go through. And then really you just kind of connect it. That's why it's called a basic graph, because we don't actually know what's going on here in the middle. It could shoot all the way back down somewhere and look really crazy, or it could be just a really little connection. We don't know because we're not finding out that information. But this gives us a pretty general idea of what this polynomial function is doing solely based on our leading term test, our zeros, and our multiplicities. Questions? Okay, I have an extra example that I don't have worked out, so we're going to work it out together. And that's why there's another graph over here is for this one. Extra example, we're doing the exact same thing. We have negative 4 parentheses x plus a half squared times parentheses x minus 5 to the cube. So what is our leading coefficient? Negative 4. So this will be negative. Then what is the degree of this polynomial? It's 5. There's two x's here and three x's here. There's no x with that 4. That's just a 4. You have 2 plus 3. That equals 5. So this is a odd, a negative odd. So what's my end behavior doing? Begins up, ends down. Great. And then here's the nice thing. We don't have to do any factoring. They already did all the work for us. If we have 0 equals negative 4 times x plus 1 half squared times x minus 5 to the third, we would divide that negative 4 over just to get rid of it. Now everything is factored, everything is nice, and you can't see it. There it is. So we set each of our factors equal to 0 and solve. Square root both sides, subtract that 1 half over, and you get x equals a negative 1 half. What is the multiplicity at x equals negative 1 half? How many times would we get it? That would get it twice, because this is saying x plus 1 half times x plus 1 half. But instead of writing all that and setting it equal to 0 twice, we just look at the power on it. So we have a multiplicity of 2. If it has a multiplicity of 2, what's it going to do at that? A 0. It's going to bounce. Got to bounce back. Okay, do the same thing for x minus 5 to the third. Set it equal to 0. Take the cube root, add 5 over, you get x equals 5. The multiplicity when x equals 5 is 3, so that's odd. What happens when we have an odd multiplicity? Yeah, we cross. We're going to go through at that point. Okay, so we've got... A zero, we've got a zero, we know what our end behavior is going to do, and we know that we're going to bounce and go through. So let's go up to our graph. There's one, two, three, four, five. So x was negative a half, that was our zero. x was positive five, that was a zero. We know our end behavior from our leading term test was going up on the left, down on the right. 
And then we found the multiplicity at negative a half was two, so that means we bounce. So we're coming back up here. We know the multiplicity on five was three. That's an odd, so that means we go through there. Notice then that we're ending up on the same side, which is really good because we do need these to connect. Again, we call this a sketch of a graph, not an actual graph, because we didn't actually find like our y-intercept and all that information, which we could find and we will find in 4.2. But this gives us a pretty good idea of what that graph is doing just based on the little bit of information that we have.